you, brother. All right, we got one minute. One minute. Do me a favor. Yeah. Give this to Ellen. Thank you. We'll do. <coughs> one minute. <coughs> We've got um, handouts in the back. We've got Revelation study notebooks in the back available. We've got two cards uh, to sign back there. You can do that at. As you, we, <laughs> you, Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, that was so embarrassing. <clears throat> oh, it was embarrassing. And I'm thankful that it was traumatic. That means you care. <laughs> Instead of, yay. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and get started. It is 10 o'clock in the morning. We've got a lot to cover today. <clears throat> We are going to finish, and I could say this definitively, we are going to finish all the seven churches of Revelation today because we only have one to cover, <coughs> and that is the church of Laodicea, um, and then we are going to dive into, some would say, the third division in Revelation. I say the most significant division in the book of Revelation um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, especially chronologically, timeline goes. And so we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3, verse, uh, verses 14 to 24. <clears throat> I'm, like always, going to read that, then back up and expound upon it. Uh, let me just say out of the gate that um, today is one of those rare opportunities you get to hear why a pastor, a church, holds a certain theological position, especially pertaining to eschatology, to end time study. Um, this is a church, I'm a pastor, um, that believes in a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial rapture, um, meaning I believe that God is going to call all of the saints in Christ out of this earth before the seven year tribulation period, uh, before the thousand year millennial reign. And so uh, we don't have a lot of scriptures. Bill is here. We don't have a lot of, I promised your wife I wasn't going to embarrass you, and I just, yay! <coughs> um, <coughs> today we are about to approach one of the um, biggest scriptures, not only explicitly, but implicitly, that support that view. Um, and so today you will find one of the reasons why um, I am a, guy that believes in layman's terms that there's coming a day that Christ is going to make a shout and the dead in Christ will rise and then we as Christians will be caught up in the air and the seven year tribulation period will start. Antichrist will come on the scene. Um, you'll have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, the four horsemen, the seven visions, all those things happening. And then after that's over, Christ will come back um, through a door that we'll talk about today in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We will be with him, and he will finally throw Satan into hell forever, into that lake of fire, um, and evil will be done um, after that thousand-year millennial reign and the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and the new us. So <clears throat> today you get some insight, uh, which is rare, but we will get in there. So let's take There we go. Uh, to the book of Revelation, chapter number uh, 3, starting at verse number 14. And this is the last of the seven churches. And Pastor Dan, what does the number 7, what do we believe that represents? 7 is the number of completion. <clears throat> 7 it can certainly be the number of completion. And so this is the last of the churches. Um, I believe they are real, literal churches that were alive, active, and, th and thriving to a degree. Um, in Asia Minor when John had been uh, sent to the island of Patmos because of his belief, persecution, and Christ. Um, but I also believe there can be some evidence to support every church represents a church age. Uh, but however you view that, here Jesus is telling John, I want you to write to the pastor of the church of Laodicea. And this is this final state of apostasy. Uh, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews speaks much about this. Verse number 14. 
<coughs> under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I would that you be hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spoo thee out of my mouth. Can you even imagine being a church on a Sunday morning and your pastor standing up there and saying, Jesus has some words for you all. You make him sick to his stomach. Um, that wouldn't give you goosebumps to go home feeling pretty good, would it? Um, I might be looking for another church. Um, but that's the message to this church. Because, verse 17, you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need for nothing and knows not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. <clears throat> I'm working on my Memorial Day sermon for the last Sunday of this month, and I believe that is one of the issues that is prevalent with America at this point. We have had so much excess and so much cushion that we don't know how to handle conflict. We don't know how to handle the word no. We don't know how to deal with troubles and trials and tribulation. We um, are being tossed around by circumstance, and that is exactly what was happening to the city of the church of Laodicea. They had so much money and so much wealth um, and so many victories over the years that they became complacent um, and relying on money and housing and jobs and health instead of relying on Jesus Christ, the source of all of those things. And without even knowing about it, they could look in the mirror as a congregation and as people and say, we don't have any needs. We are blessed as a nation, as a city. I think that's where America has been. We have been blessed, but what we don't realize, just like Laodicea, we have gone past the blessings and now we are just under the shade of the tree that was planted by the sacrifices made by our forefathers that put God first, one nation under God. And now we are just in excess um, and we have put God aside. And we have said like the church of Laodicea, I am rich, increased with goods, have need for nothing. Um, and yet we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou might be rich, and white raiment. Let me back up. Do you remember one of the churches promised if they repent and believe in Jesus, they would be given white robes? And what does white signify? Purity. Our sins have been washed as white as snow, and that comes through Christ. And so even with a church that makes him sick to his stomach, what a wonderful picture of the grace of God that even this group, the most miserable group, the, the most rebellious, the most distant church that there ever existed, Laodicea, even Jesus to this church says that I'm counseling you, I want you to be rich, I want you to wear white clothes, that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear and anoint your eyes with eye salve. I'm gonna to touch on that in a second that thou mayest see, as many as I love, now let me put a dot there for a second, how many does Jesus love? He does. I put on Twitter yesterday, there has never been one that has been born that God didn't love. Um, so we can rejoice in that. His love shines through, but he continues that, and here is where I believe many Christians are missing the mark. We are a nation that loves, love everybody, love everybody, tolerate everybody, compromise with everybody, love, 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 love. But this is what Jesus said, because true love also judges. True love also has consequences. True love also involves discipline. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. You can love without compromise. You can love without agreeing. You can love without condoning what somebody else is doing. I love Pastor Dan, but I don't like before he gets his morning coffee how grumpy he is. Yeah, amen. <laughs> as, many, as, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chase and be zealous, therefore. And there's the common day, there, there is the challenge again repent, 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 repent. 
Those are the first words John uttered, repent, be baptized. The first message that Jesus gave, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And here again, um, that's the message. And to be very clear, that is a word and that is a message that churches just aren't preaching and teaching anymore. Now it's just everybody come and enjoy the love of God, but you can't have love without judgment. You can't have love without discipline. You can't have love without sacrifice. Jesus is the author of love, and even he is saying, as many as I love, I also rebuke and I chasten. <clears throat> so if you want to take your hand out, um, I've titled this The Church of Compromise, Laodicea, the last of the seven churches. <clears throat> this was a city that was taken over by a very special general of Alexander the Great himself. And, of course, Alexander the Great, um, Greek, um, Hellenism, he spread his culture and religion, but what they would do is they would allow locally taken over cities to sort of blend in and become Greek, but also they could have some of their things as well as long as they compromise um, and dilute their beliefs, <clears throat> especially religiously. Um, interesting, when you look at the verse um, that says in verse number 19, anoint your eyes with eye salve. Interesting, Laodicea was famous when John wrote this letter to them for an eye salve that people would travel miles when they had hearing issues, but especially sight issues. Um, the older you get, and I just did this intentionally, the blurrier your vision usually becomes, right? Yeah. Uh, I put my glasses off just now, and I just see a, a bunch of white blended together. <clears throat> now I can see you clearly. But when they would have blurry vision or double vision or eye pain or a sty in their eye or a physical issue, whatever it was, cataracts, they would go to the city of Laodicea, and these people, these doctors, would take the clay from the ground add spicknard and other um, uh, ingredients to it, herbs and whatnot, and then they would take this mud and they would rub it in the people's eyes. And they would travel for miles just to get that special eye salve. They were famous for it. Um, interest, that's what they were known for. Interesting, recent science has put together that exact same prescription. Gone to this town, gotten the clay, mixed it like they did then, and they have found it to be completely neutral. It doesn't hurt you, but it doesn't help you either. There's no healing properties in it whatsoever. Looks good, sounds good, it's substance, but it does nothing for it. It doesn't hurt you, but it doesn't help you. That's interesting. Just sort of keep a dot in that thought for a second. Um, so let me back up a little bit. Um, to chapter 4, verse number 1, and I want to reread verse number 1, and I'm going to emphasize um, some words. Chapter 4. Huh? Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. What did I say? You said 4 1. I just questioned you, but it's okay. Oh, yeah. I guess I need to talk a little bit about more the handout, don't I? I got excited. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Dan. All right, so the culture. <laughs> Wow, I'm just, I didn't get to preach Sunday, so it's all built up. I'm just, I'm, just ready, I'm just so excited and ready to go to these notes, and I forgot to look at that one. Um, so yeah, so in your handout, we have culture, Christ, commendation, condemnation, challenge, and celebration, following the same model that we've used for every single church, the last one. But again, culture-wise, I just bring out the ISAF um, was famous, but again, completely neutral. Christ reveals himself in Revelation 3.14, as the faithful and true witness. Um, and that's what compromise does. Compromise takes the truth um, and adds falsities to it and creates something new. And that's exactly what Laodicea has done. That's exactly what so many churches have done. They have compromised for the sake of numbers. They have compromised for the sake of unity. They have compromised um, for the sake of money or popularity or a name. Um, but they are neutral. And so Christ is saying in the midst of this, I am the faithful and true witness. Interestingly, the commendation, what they've done good, nothing. 
this church has not one good thing that Christ can say of it. That should be shocking considering a church is not a building, but a church is hundreds or more people, and not one of those people can Christ say they are doing well. Not their works, not their deeds, not their faith, not their ministry, not their missions. They were a church, they were active, they were alive, they had a pastor, they had deacons, they had elders, they had a congregation, they had a music program, they had ministries and missions and activities, and yet Jesus looks at it all and says there's something there, but there's nothing good that they are doing. Just like their eye salve, there's something there, but it's doing no good. And so a condemnation, what they were doing bad, is just simply hypocrisy. <clears throat> it's just simply hypocrisy. Somebody tell me what they think hypocrisy means in your best definition. That's a good one. Absolutely. Pretending to be somebody that you're not. Past Dan, any thoughts on hypocrisy? I think they're all correct. It's, it also lends itself towards we know what God has said and we're going to go against it, and that's hypocrisy. I believe that Christians have unintentionally started more religions and cults and paved the ha path to hell even unintentionally more than any other group of people. I think that's what hypocrisy has done. I think Christians living hypocritical lives, and that's what Laodicea was. They're on the fence. They're fence-riding Christians. They're neither hot nor they're cold. And Jesus said, I vomit you out of my mouth. I believe that hypocrisy, hypocritical Christians have even unintentionally paved the road to hell for many. I will give you three very brief examples. In the 6th century, there was a man born... His mom died when he was seven years old. He was raised by his father who died, left him in the care of his uncle. Um, and yet in spite of losing his mom, in spite of losing his dad and being raised by an uncle, he turned out to be a really stellar guy in his community. Um, he was honest. He was hardworking. He was a religious man. During Ramadan, he would take off and, and pray and fast and not eat and seek the face of God. Every year he would go off in isolation from sunup to sundown, spending that time in prayer. During one of these times of isolations in prayer, and I'm using my fingers intentionally, an angel came to visit him and declared him to be God's new messenger and gave him the task of starting a new religion. That scared him. That scared him. So he ran out of the cave. He ran home. He told his wife, and he said, we need to pray for God's protection. That, that's not right. That's scary what just happened. We need God to protect us. Well, his wife decided that she had a better idea, and she said, you need to go talk to my cousin who knows some things about the Christian faith. She's a Christian, and she can help navigate through this. So he went to this cousin who was a Christian savant, someone that had a reputation for being informed and educated in Christianity, known as a Christian expert even. And this Christian confirmed his calling, declared him to be a true prophet of God, empowered him to start a new religion, and that new religion was the, is now the most second fastest growing religion in the world. He was Mohammed and the religion is Islam. All because, I believe, of a hypocrite. 1869, Mahatma Gandhi was born in India and became the voice and leader of the third world's largest religion, Hinduism. But what you might not know at one point in his search and in his life, he decided, I'm going to look into other religions. And Sikhism was one that he found that he liked. He incorporated Sikhism a little bit in Hinduism. But what you might not know is he really was attracted to Christianity. He was so close to believing everything, but he ended up walking away from Christianity, and here is what he said, and I quote, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ, unquote. Hypocrisy. In 1930, Howard was born in Chicago, very intelligent man, troubled past, dropped out of high school, and he joined the carnival. Remember those days when people actually did that? 
He joined the carnival and he got to see a lot of different religions and even dabbled in the occult a little bit as he traveled around with the carnival. But he was a seeker. He was really, truly trying to find any truth in religion out there. So he, like the others that I already talked about, were drawn and attracted to Christianity more than any. And so he even started playing the organ on Sunday nights at the carnival for the church services. This is what he wrote of Christianity. On Saturday night, I would see men lusting after half-naked girls dancing at the carnival. And on Sunday morning, I was playing the organ for tent show evangelists at the other end of the carnival lot. I would see these same men sitting in the pews with their wives and their children, asking God to forgive them and purge them of their carnal desires. And the next Saturday night, these same men would be back at the carnival or some other place of indulgence. Now listen to his last statement. I knew then that the Christian church thrives on hypocrisy and that man's carnal nature will out. He went on to write a book and start a church. The book was the church. The church was the church of Satan. The book was the Satanic Bible. Anthony LaVey was his name. I say all that to say this. As we look at this last church, Laodicea, and we look at the condemnation hypocrisy, what we need to understand is our lives are not just confined and limited to us. There are people watching. There are, people's, there are people around us that our lives are making a difference, good or bad. And we cannot just be hot or cold and ride the fence or lukewarm or average or mediocre or complacent. The picture is much bigger. The scope is much larger. We are impacting people whether we recognize it or not. And so we must recognize the severity of hypocrisy in our own lives, especially as a church. And so the challenge was, in verse 18, anoint your eyes with eye salve. That's interesting because they were famous for that eye salve. So I wonder when the pastor said, all right, here's how you get out of the mess. God doesn't have anything good to say about our congregation. In fact, we're making him sick. We have let him down that much. But to change, we need to anoint our eyes with eye salve. Well, to them, that meant just going down to the local Laodicean Walmart and grabbing a tube of Laodicean eye salve and putting it on their eyes. But we know this to be spiritually what does the Bible say? That when we get saved, the scales of our eyes are opened and we can finally see the truth. And the truth shall set you free. That was the connection. Jesus revealed himself in verse 14 as the faithful and true witness. And then he says, anoint your eyes with the eye salve. And that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the celebration is, <clears throat> behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice opens the door, I will come to him, sup with him, and eat with me. And here's another, at the end of verse 20, 21, grant to sit with me in my throne. So this is the only church that Jesus is on the outside of. All the other churches he's in the midst of, and he's speaking intimately and involved and engaged. But this church, he has this picture, and you've seen the artwork, right? Jesus knocking on the door. You've heard preachers say Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on anybody. And every time a pastor says that, I'm like, well, then how do you explain Pharaoh and Moses and Jonah? <laughs> how do you explain Jonah? Um, but when it comes to salvation, he is not going to force anybody into a love relationship with him. And that is the picture. He is on the outside of this church, knocking on our heart's door to anybody who will open it up. We can go with him, sup with him, he with us, but sit with me in my throne. As we get there in the next week or two, we are going to see in Revelation chapter 4, a throne of God with 24 seats 
with elders sitting around those 24 seats. And so I would submit to you that right at the beginning, um, we are going to find another thought for the rapture. That being said, let's dive into Revelation chapter number four. Fast Dan, moving on from Laodicea, anything there that you want to address? No, sir, I believe you've nailed it. I mean, I've, I've always thought the Laodicean church is the modern American church. What? Absolutely. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's just the truth. And, and let, me, let me just define that, because, I mean, you know, hearing this, you don't, I don't think anybody of us wants to be in danger of being a hypocrite in the eyes of God. I, I mean, that, that's a horrible place to be that you make God sick to his stomach. That's, you know, not only do you have to worry about the consequence and the judgment and the wrath and the discipline from God when he looks at you that way, but just knowing that you're hurting God that much, that takes on a different level. So let me just say this. I don't think anybody can reach perfection down here. I mean, I, I don't think anybody can reach a spot where God says, all right, you're good. You don't need any more of the Bible. You don't need any more faith. You've achieved. But I think all of us can reach the point of purity. Maybe not perfection, but purity. Hypocrisy refuses to advance toward purity. Hypocrisy says, I'm going to please myself. I have no need for God. I, I can be a Christian and live however I want, do whatever I want, tell the jokes I want, watch the movies I want, and still go to church on Sunday. That's hypocrisy. If the world is not looking at you and seeing a supernatural power within you, that's the issue. Are we going to fail? Are we going to come short? Are we going to miss the mark? Absolutely. <laughs> Sunday I made mistakes. <laughs> In front of everybody. Yes, absolutely. But nobody should be able to, and Miss Lucy, God bless you for helping me Sunday, by the way. Um, nobody should be... Nobody should be able to look at you and say, they're the reason and be justified. They're the reason I don't go to church. They're the reason I want nothing to do with Christ. They could look at you and say, boy, they're a mess. Boy, they're, they're just a, a, a hot mess. They make mistakes, but they, they love God, you know. Uh, remember Anita Wildhaber? She used to call some people that were a mess, but real believers, real Christians, she'd say those people uh, needed uh, MGR. They were MGR people. More grace required, <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, you know those people in your lives. They, they struggle maybe more than others. They fall down a lot more than others. Sometimes they're hard-headed and they don't learn. But you know and you see in their lives, they love Jesus. They're just struggling. They're at a different part of their journey than maybe you are. Um, those are the kind of people that, um, anyway, so not perfection, but purity. Chapter number four, I'm going to read verse number one. I think I'm ready this time, Pastor Dan. Yes, sir. And I'm going to emphasize some words. After this, that's the first one, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Door was opened in heaven. And the first voice, the first voice I heard as if it were a trumpet talking with me. Anybody in here like jazz, by the way? In the jazz, I'm not a big jazz person, but when I was researching this a little bit, I found in the jazz culture, they say that the trumpet talks. It talks to you. I'd never heard that until last week. I was like, that's interesting. So the trumpet talks to you. But I, I want you to remember that the first voice, which I heard as a trumpet, see if any of this sounds familiar, talking with me, which said, come up hither, interesting, and I will show thee things which must be after this. Some translations say hereafter, but I'm pointing out that the beginning of verse 1 and the end of verse 1 in the Greek, they are the same exact words. After this, I looked, and then at the end must be after this. In the Greek, they are the same words. This is significant. This is significant. So, 
Before I go into too much detail, let me back up a little bit and give you some implicit and explicit reasons why I believe chapter 4 um, is essential for us to establish the argument that the rapture happens before the tribulation. <clears throat> if you remember from another handout, two churches ago, Philadelphia, the Church of Philadelphia, um, in Revelation 3.9, Jesus said, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of tribulation. Pastor Dan, what do you think the hour of tribulation is? The great and terrible day of the Lord, the beginning of the tribulation period. <clears throat> Absolutely. We believe, and most theologians believe, that the hour of temptation revealed to the Philadelphia church I will keep you from the hour of temptation is speaking um, upon, uh, about the seven-year tribulation period, which, according to Revelation 3.10, will come upon all of the world and them that dwell on the earth. So here we find there's coming a big hour of temptation that the whole world is going to be involved in except a group of people. Has there ever been, ever been a time in history in the Bible that a group of people went through severe tribulation, but there was a special group of people that didn't receive some of those. They were protected. Oh, yes. Definitely the flood. That's a good one. What did you say? I said yes. Yeah. When, when, <laughs> <laughs> when, when um, just before Jerusalem was um, destroyed, all of the church fled. It's called the um, the dispersia, mm -hmm. and all of the, well, not just the church, but the Jews went out into all the rest of the world because True. Jerusalem was smashed. True. H how about um, how about Goshen, the land of Goshen mm -hmm. in Egypt? The land of Goshen. Some of the plagues that the Egyptians experienced, even though everybody was experiencing, God saved them from that special time. Doesn't the Bible say that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Amen. So we have history many times that God has kept his people from a terrible wrath and tribulation that will befall others, a remnant. So when God says to the church of Philadelphia, if you repent, if you love me, I will keep you from the hour of trip, temp, temptation that will come to all the world. <clears throat> so we find that and now here we are in Revelation chapter number 4, and this is the most interesting part. Implicitly, there is, I don't think, any greater argument for a rapture before the tribulation period, and that view is becoming less popular as the years tick on for some reason. I don't understand why. There's a lot of people now that are believing the rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation, some believe it happens after the tribulation, um, but I believe it happens before the tribulation. Now, here's my thought. We just went through all of chapter 2 and all of chapter 3. What did we learn in chapter 2 and 3? What was it about? The church, seven churches, seven real literal churches in Asia Minor during when John was on the island of Patmos under 100 A.D., um, that were alive, that were functioning, and there are a group of people, and I'm not really arguing it, I, I'm not really a big fan, but that think they represent church ages. But what we can all agree on is that the entire focus of chapter 2 and chapter 3 was all about the church. In fact, the church was mentioned 19 times in just those two chapters. The church on earth, the church on earth, 19 times, seven churches. Now, we hit chapter number 4, and from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 19, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, the four horsemen, the beasts, the angels, the plagues, the church isn't mentioned one time. The church is gone. Where did she go? I believe so. I believe now from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 19, the church, while it was on earth for chapter 2 and 3, 
The reason it's absent is because now we, as a church, are in glory, having a, an, an overview of what is happening until Revelation 19 or so, when Christ comes through that fourth door and comes back in the second coming, we with him as his army. The other thought is this, and I highlighted this, after this I looked, and then it ends with after this. After these things, after these things. Pa Pastor Dan is a, a big advocate of if, if scripture or a word is used as a bookend, it starts it and it ends it, there's significance there. Amen. The author is intentional in emphasizing this. In one verse, he starts with after this and he ends with after this. And what he is saying, what he is communicating is, John, this is not going to happen in your day. After this, for those that thought the tribulation was upon him, for those that thought the destruction of Jerusalem was the great tribulation, for those that thought that it already had happened in Thessal Thessalonica, that was the issue. Did, did Christ, our, what's going to happen to our dead? What's, we're confused, De death after life, uh, life after death. He is making it very clear. These are things that have yet to happen. They, they are in the future. Um, Pastor and, Tom? Yeah. Um, just after the Thessalonica passage that talks about the rapture, Paul says in chapter 5, verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath. Amen. And the tribulation <coughs> period is the time of God's wrath. Amen. Amen. And, and the Bible also uses that where nobody likes to hear this, and I don't even use it that often because, um, you know, un unless I have a relationship with somebody. Um, but you know what the Bible calls people that aren't saved? Children of wrath. That's what the Bible calls people that are not saved, children of wrath. And, and who is wrath? Yes, children of Satan. Um, that's who we were before we were adopted into the family of God, and now Jesus is our Father. Um, he saved us from wrath. And, and, and so, and, and I, I guess it, 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 it amuses me whenever we hear about technology and people saying, oh, that's the mark of the beast, I'm not going to take it. The mark of the beast doesn't come until the seven-year tribulation period. You're not going to be here for that. And all the, yes, I mean, we're talking about he must be the Antichrist. He, it hasn't happened yet. Could the Antichrist be alive right now? Sure. Possibly, possibly. But we're not going to know who he is until he breaks the peace agreement halfway through the tribulation. And we'll be three and a half years eating fat-free foods at the table of God. Amen. <clears throat> all right. Yes. Um, so verse number one, after this I looked and behold a door was opened. Now this isn't hugely significant, but I found um, in the original writings, um, it speaks that John showed up and the door has already been opened. Some of the translations say that he saw it opening. This is important. It, he did not see it opening. The original manuscripts show it was already a door that was already opened when he got there. He was just observing. Why is that important? Well, the theologians give us three, sometimes four doors, different doors in the book of Revelation. One of them was found in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 8, which we read last week. I know your works, speaking to the church of Philadelphia, behold, I have set before you an open door that no man can shut. So that's the first door of revelation, and that is the door of evangelism. God opens that door, and only God can open that door because only his son Jesus Christ is that door. Jesus himself in the book of John said, I am the door. And so that door is open. Will that door be open through the tribulation period? Absolutely it will. Absolutely. Will that door eventually be shut? Absolutely it will. Which is why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't mess around when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. Repent and be baptized today. Because uh, that door eventually will be shut. So the first door in Revelation is a door of evangelism in Revelation 3.8. The second door is the door of your heart in Revelation 3.20, which we just read. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man open that door... 
He will come to me and I with him. He will eat with me. I will eat with him. That is the door of our heart. And that must be opened by us. Yes, I brought up, you know, because it, it drives me crazy to hear people say, God doesn't, God's a gentleman. He doesn't force anybody to do anything. Again, tell that to Jonah. Yes, he does. But when it comes to salvation, a love relationship with him, that's all on us. We must open the door to our heart. We must let him in. We must repent and surrender to him. And then the third door is the one we just addressed in Revelation 4.1, and I, I call this the door of revelation. Um, I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And, and I think the best thing that I can use to describe this is that once we get saved, and I believe John is representing us, so John is exposed to all of these churches like we are exposed to all of these churches. John sees the good, the bad, and the ugly in every different church. And we should be evaluating and seeing the good, the bad, and ugly in every church. Um, and then John is caught up into heaven. One day we, like John, will be caught up into heaven to meet Jesus in the air. Um, and when that happens, when we get saved, when we open up our heart door... Um, to Christ and allow him into our lives and to change us and cause us to be new creatures in Christ, we have an understanding of Scripture that we never had before. We can understand the words of God. Uh, without Christ, you can't understand this. And so he gives us that revelation. And then the last door is found in Revelation 19.11, and I won't turn there, but that's the door that Jesus comes through for the second coming. He comes back again and touches his feet down um, on earth and starts the end of it all. <coughs> uh, starts, ends the beginning of it all, however you want to say that. <coughs> um, so that was the door. Now I want you to notice and see if you pick up anything. In verse number one, I heard the first voice which I heard. Well, that brings us back to Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 10. When John started this all out, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So I want you to remember this. So Revelation 4, now he's going from Patmos on earth. Now he is in heaven, and again he hears that same voice. I heard the first voice, which I heard as if it were a trumpet talking to me. So a voice, a trumpet, and said, come up hither. Interesting. I think all that sounds a little too familiar. Trumpets in the nation of Israel, which John, these churches, everybody would have been familiar with. Most of us are familiar Trumpets were blown in the nation of Israel, especially in the wilderness wanderings, to rally them all together. It was a big, and everybody would come together. Can you do that again? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would also be blown for them to pick up and move to a better location. How'd that go, Pastor Dan? Mine was so much better. It was. It really was. Yes, the trumpet has significance to the nation of Israel. They knew that that was that calling. You responded. It was time to go. It was time to move on. It was time to go somewhere better. And so that trumpet. Now, here's my thought. A voice that's a powerful voice, a demanding voice, gets your attention voice, a trumpet. And we know a description of Christ, he also has the voice of many waters, right? This consuming, you have to pay attention to it. If someone came into this room right now and snuck up behind you and blew a trumpet, everybody's attention would be on them no matter what I was saying. It demands attention. So just think about this. A voice, a powerful voice, a voice of a trumpet saying, come up hither. Now I want to read to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be 
caught up, come up hither, caught up together with those in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall it ever be with the Lord. Not many theologians would argue that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 is a rapture text. What they will argue about is whether it happens before, in the middle, or after the tribulation. I am positing it happens before the tribulation. And we are John in Revelation chapter 4, 1. He hears the trumpet, he hears the voice, and he is caught up. Thessalonians, we hear a trumpet, we hear a voice, and we're caught up. Now that word caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, you don't hear rapture, you hear caught up, which is harpazo in the Greek, which means to snatch away quickly, immediately. Verse number 2, and immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one that sat on the throne. Interesting, immediately. And that's what harpazo means from first that immediately, trumpet, voice, calling, rapture, caught up, harpazo, immediately. And I would say to you today, whether it's through the clouds, because that's going to happen immediately, in the blinking of an eye, the twinkling of an eye, that's going to happen. Two men walking in a field, one is gone. Wife wakes up, husband's gone. Whether it happens as a rapture, and we all go... Wouldn't that be wonderful if that happened today? We all meet in the clouds with Jesus. Uh, I should have had somebody sneak in and blow a trumpet just now. That would have been cool. It would have sounded much better. Yes, it would. <laughs> um, that's going to happen quickly. And I believe, just a side note, I believe it'll be explained away. Because how do you explain all these people gone just like that? I believe it'll be explained away by aliens and UFOs. I, I really believe that, and I think Hollywood has been building that case since the 30s. Um, but anyway, or you go by casket. Either clouds or casket, it's going to happen immediately. Uh, we know that Paul said absent from the body is to be present, and that word is the sense of urgency, immediately. So whether you go by clouds or casket, there's no holding pattern, there's no purgatory. You are with Christ either way. Clouds or casket, being a Christian definitely has benefits. Um, now, here's another thought. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. Verse 3, last verse. And he that sat on it to look upon was, and there's three stones mentioned, jasper, sardine, and a rainbow. You'll get to the stone here in a second. Around the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So you have jasper, sardine, and emerald. Interesting. One that sat on the throne. What does that mean? And we, we, nobody argues this one is God. It's God himself. God Almighty, the beginning and the ending, the first, the last, the alpha, the omega. God is sitting on this throne. What does it mean that he's sitting? I think this is important. First of all, it means that he is resting in authority. He's resting in authority. Um, this whole idea that there's this battle between good and evil, that the Bible says, what is Satan doing right now? He's roaming the earth like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's active, he's moving, he's working, he's doing, he's seeding, he's planting, he's reaping, he's sowing. And what is God doing? He's got his feet up. It's, that's authority. There's no struggle between good and evil. It ends when he opens up his mouth. There's no struggle. He is sitting and resting on a throne in authority. Folks, we as believers should take great comfort in that, that God that knows everything has so much authority that he is sitting down. The first thing we do when things go wrong is we get up and we pace and we work and we try God is sitting down in heaven what a powerful place to be it's a place of authority but it's also a place of security you know there there were times in my 14 years military service uh, where I couldn't sit down you could die if you sat down in some of those times but there were other times like the year I was stationed in a top secret NATO bunker protected by the Marines, the Air Force, and the Navy, 
and I could sleep and close my eyes and have no worries at all. Um, Folks, isn't that wonderful to know that God is sitting down? He is in a place where the treasures that we have laid up in heaven, rust can't corrupt it, thief can't steal it, and nothing can damage it. It is completely safe in glory. He is sitting, a place of authority, and he is sitting, a place of security. But lastly, and I'll close, close, I'm going to present this in a way that hopefully you haven't before. But verse number three, these three stones, for me, show this this throne of salvation, this beautiful picture of salvation. I researched these stones a little bit. Jasper was the first one mentioned um, in verse number three. It's not the jasper that we have today. But in the Greek, it meant this translucent, kind of clear stone. And everybody acknowledges that it represents purity. The sardine is this fiery red stone. If you ever remember being in church, maybe as a kid, doing something you ought not to, and you got a look from your mama? Eyes like fire, right? You got that look. That's what fiery red represents, judgment. Judgment from who? Judgment from God. And then the last one was a rainbow like an emerald. It dawned on me, one of my favorite movies of all time was made in 1939, Wizard of Oz. Follow the yellow brick road to the emerald city, and there's a rainbow somewhere over the rainbow. Interesting connection. Yes, yes. (laughs) Interesting connection. So here's my thought. The throne of salvation. Jasper is purity. Who's the only one that's pure? God, Jesus, God, absolutely. So that represents who he is. Sardine is fiery red, the judgment of God. Who deserves judgment of God? Us, all of us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. So that, uh, so let me move on. So then the rainbow, that represents grace, a covenant that God has with us, a promise of love. It's been perverted and abused, but that's what the rainbow is. So Jasper That's who God is. He is holy. He is pure. He is righteous. Sardine, that's who we are. Wretched, miserable, poor, lost. But emerald is the grace of God. Who God is, who we are, and what it took to get us in a position of love and adoption. On my license plate, well, the license plate itself says, ask me. And I was at Chick-fil-A a a couple weeks ago, first time anybody ever took me up on it. And the lady went around, and she went back, and she came up, and she said, all right, I got to ask you, what do I need to ask you? (laughs) My mind was nowhere near my license plate. I was like, I guess you're going to ask me what I want to (laughs) order. And she she said, sir, your license plate says ask me. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, ask me how a rebellious miserable, angry wretch like me can be loved by God, given peace and power, adopted and given a home to go to in heaven one day. And she said, how? And I said, Jesus Christ, he is the only way. That is the throne of salvation right there in that description. And if you're not careful, you won't pick it out. But just those three stones represent who God is, Jasper, Sardine, who we are, and then the rainbow, what it took to bring us into a relationship with God as unworthy and as unrighteous as we are. That's the throne of salvation. And that's the throne that Hebrews says that we as Christians can now boldly approach the throne of God. All right, Pastor Dan, if you could cut us off. I've got some prayer requests and some announcements.